If I say to you, right, man, we warm up first, of course, but then we've got one set of leg press or squats or whatever you want to do, man, you're going to fucking go on this. You're going to go to the bottom and you're going to come up and you're going to fucking keep doing this until you die, man. And when you think you're dying, I'm going to fucking make you do two more until you literally can't walk. I'm taking time out. I'm checking out of this story, this movie that we're in, this illusion. And it is, it's an illusion. We're living in a holographic computer generated reality. If someone put a gun to your head and said like, man, you must do more, you must do more, you must help more people. Like what, what would you do differently? I've been playing around with this idea of doing my own podcast. If you could leave nothing to your children, but just one sentence of advice, what would it be and why? Thanks so much for accepting my invitation. Thanks for being on the show, man. It's a real pleasure. pleasure. I like chatting with like-minded uh, people and uh, let's get something out there and uh, influence the collective. That's what I'm all about. Same here, man. Thanks so much for being on the show. I am so happy to have you here. There are two major reasons for that. The first one is I was, I think I was 11 or 12 when was the first time I went to the gym in Bulgaria with my brother. It was a old crappy gym everything was rusty it smelled like shit They're but the best gyms, man. The best gyms definitely yeah. and there were two huge pictures on the wall one was a picture of you and the other was arnold yeah. and and you guys were our idols at that time and because of you we went and trained in the gym so i can only imagine how many people's lives you have influenced and i'm guessing that you cannot really imagine from different parts of the world people that don't necessarily go into bodybuilding but just try to live a healthier life and do fitness and do sports so that is one of the reasons and the other one is that you are a very rare breed in the sense that you're not afraid to speak about topics which other people shy away from which yeah. i really respect in you i believe is so important and we spoke about it before we hit record here and how we're in a very special time and how we can really expect big changes coming for the future. And I believe that you are one of the people who will be a catalyst in that change. So I'm proud to have you here. Proud to have people like you living among well, us, man. Um, absolutely. I mean, I, I, <clears throat> I'm aware of how many people I influenced um, to, to go to the gym, pick up weights, and, and to be interested in bodybuilding. But uh, maybe more importantly than that, um, something that's evolved obviously to where I am now but even as a bodybuilder I think I was conscious of the the mental aspect of, uh, of of being a successful bodybuilder but that uh, the lessons that I learned there could really translate into any aspect of your life um, mm. so great that I influence people to go to the gym and lift and but it's more about positivity just as long as I had a positive influence on somebody, then that's a great thing. Um, and if I had a positive influence on many people, then that's, that's even better. Um, I have come to realize over the last few years that the, the bodybuilding, the Mr. Olympia and everything that I achieved there, which I'm, I'm obviously, I'm very proud of that. Um, but now I'm seeing it almost as a platform that I, that I created, not consciously maybe, but anyway, I created this platform that um, people are interested to listen to me, to what I had to say. And um, I started doing some podcasts maybe, I think six years ago or so on, where I started speaking on subjects other than bodybuilding. Bodybuilding as well, because people are interested in that, that's fine. But talking about some other subjects, um, more, maybe more um, on the mental side and, and spiritual side and sharing my my thoughts and, and my journey along that path and, and inspiring other people. Um, so I do, um, I have a nutrition company, DY Nutrition. Um, so I do promotional um, work with that at, at contests and expos, and I'm getting still a tremendous amount of people coming, but now that it's kind of a bit different, the angle that people are coming from. It's not just about the training, and there's a lot of young people there. I mean, 20, 21, 22, uh, 
you know, 22 years ago was my last contest. So the fact that I'm having influence also on younger people that were not even born when I was doing the bodybuilding is, is great. And I've had a lot of people come up to me at these events and shake my hand and say, thank you, Dorian. Like, you don't know this, but you literally saved my life. Just something you said or one of your speak, one of your talks or something like that had such a strong influence on me. And that, I mean, if you only can do that to one person, that's amazing. And there's more than one person that's taken the time to come and see me and tell me that. So um, this is amazing feedback that I get from just being me and telling my truth and speaking my story. Um, so that I continue to do that. That gives me more encouragement, more power, and uh, so on to keep, keep on doing that and just sharing my story, sharing my thoughts. And uh, apparently it's positive and it's helping a lot of people. So here we are doing it again. Hopefully. That is amazing, and I uh, I know you have one of uh, a story that really impressed me when you gave up one hundred thousand dollars to pursue your dream at that time, yeah. uh, which was Mr. Olympia. And I believe that what you're doing right now is kind of similar because obviously you can be profiting more by doing other stuff and talking about topics which are more monetizable or popular. But you're not Absolutely. doing this because you're following uh, uh, material possessions. They're nice, yeah. It's nice to be comfortable. Um, but it's not what life's about. I mean, I know that. I mean, I could, you know, I could have 10 Ferraris or whatever and, like, so what? It's going to be a bunch of rust in <laughs> in a period of time. It's just a thing. It's a material thing. It's nothing wrong with having these things. And if that makes you happy and you want to work towards that, great. But it's not in itself going to make you happy, feel, make you feel fulfilled, or it, and it's not the purpose of why you're here and living and having this experience of being a human and uh, in a physical realm and, and living this life. That's, that's where I'm at now. So it's things I do are, are more from the heart and, uh, you know, also to to follow my path in life and to, I'm always working towards something, trying to improve myself, whether it's physically or mentally or something. I think this is what life is about. It's not just to sit still and, and be comfortable all the time. And even people that get to that point, <laughs> they're not happy either. They, they, they have problems. So mm. um, I realize that, that there's more to life than uh, making money or material possessions. Um, so that's not my prime drive, although I have to make a living like everybody else. It's not, uh, I don't need too much. Yeah. Yeah. I different. believe none of us needs too much. And it, it you, for most people, it takes like making a lot to realize that. And some people make a lot and they still don't realize that. But I, yeah. yesterday, yesterday a, a professional footballer wrote to me and he said like, can I ask you a question? I'm in some deep shit, stuff like that. And I'm like, ask away, man. He's like, can I ask you for an advice? I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, I'm doing this thing, the football. I know that I'll be big at some point, but at the same time, I feel that I need to be doing something else. And I see this very often with people in sports, and it was my journey as well. I quit yeah. when I was 19 years old. And I heard Lewis Hamilton, who is, I don't know, five times champion in Formula One, he's like, my life has no purpose. And I'm like, no shit, man. What you're doing is like making laps, same circuits every year, like yeah. you can become what 20 times champion, but what else are you doing with your life? Well, actually I got <clears throat> to this point. I think I started feeling this point. My last competition I did in the Mr. Olympia was 1997. And I distinctly remember during this preparation was the first time when I thought, really, what am I doing here now? Why am I doing this? It's, it was a passion of mine and to push this envelope and to see how far I can go. And I think I've done that and I don't really know what the purpose is now. I'm feeling uncomfortable. I'm feeling like a job rather than a passion. And I never wanted that. And I don't know if I'm going to do this again. Uh, as it turned out, I got a very serious injury. So was, out of my hands, it was decided for me, which was very traumatic for me at the time, as I wanted to always control and plan and um, 
there's no way I could control this. And really, I was in deep shit, if you like, for a few years because I, I literally didn't know who I am and what I'm doing. And I thought, I got to do something totally different now. What shall I do with my life? I'm finished with bodybuilding. Um, but it took me some time to balance that out and to say, well, this is not that I have to do something totally different. The Mr. Olympia, the bodybuilding was a huge part of my life. It changed my life. And it, you know, I wouldn't be talking on the show now if I wasn't from that background. So it's always part of my life. Um, so it, it's still part of my life, but it's, it's not all that all consuming. It's, you know, I'm free to do so many more things now that, I, I relish that freedom that I kind of self uh, restricted myself from for so long. Um, mm. So now I can do, I can do and experience many different things without yeah. that having to be in that tunnel vision. Yeah, I, be, um, I believe the lesson in that is just being able to let go of the past because, like bodybuilding, it became the past for you at some point. Sports became the past for me at some point, and it, like it's whatever you do, the moment you start feeling like that's no longer your thing. Because you yeah. you just grow over it, and you start feeling like now I need to take on this path. And yeah, just, sometimes there's a you know we got like a, a navigator or something, or you want to call it in the heart. Mm. You know, the higher self is speaking to you through there, and it will make you start to feel uncomfortable when you're not on the right path. It's yeah. just you know like a little irritating poking thing and you got to listen to it if you don't listen to it it gets worse it gets worse and it gets worse so uh, that's the lesson i learned there to go more with what your inner feeling is mm, yeah I, i have a lot of bodybuilder friends uh, back home and a lot of them ask me to ask you uh, how do you quit bodybuilding when you're on performance drugs i know that when you quit you went through a lot of difficult times and moments yeah. in your personal life as well. So like they say, like, how do I become a normal human being again after all of that? Well, this is a good question. Um, being an extreme person, I guess, you know, you have to be extreme to be the best in the world at, at something like this, um, a sport or, or anything that requires you to put 100% of your soul into it so my my view on steroids uh <clears throat> they're you know they're a necessity in professional bodybuilding to be frank i mean let's just be honest like you can't compete without them because they give you quite an advantage and in a competitive sport you need every advantage you can get um so i accepted them more or less as a tool of the trade so a necessary evil if you like Maybe they have negative health consequences, but I tried to manage that and, you know, I justified it to me because at certain points I had checkpoints. So for instance, I, I won the British championship twice. I, I was able to turn professional and now I'm going to the professional ranks and I said, okay, I'm making a lot of sacrifices here. Personally, um, I had my wife or it was a girlfriend at the time and a young son. So they're losing time with me and focus and the sacrifice is being made all around. And then there's the steroids, which, you know, possibly have negative health consequences. So I'm going to go into this professional contest, my first one. And if I don't place in the top five, I'm not going to continue with this competitive lifestyle. Oh, I had a gym that was doing pretty good, making money in the early eighties. Gyms was like the new craze. So the gym was going well you know, I will stop the extreme lifestyle and the competition and the steroids and I will just maybe open more gyms and concentrate on this and stay in shape. But my first pro concert, I got second. So it was a check for me. I always have to justify this risk. And then I'm a professional and I'm making my living, making a better, more money and a better living than I could make anywhere else. So then again, I justified it. But I always said, as soon as I stop this as a competitive sport, I stop with the steroids because I don't need them. I don't need to be this big. It's a, you know, it's a contest. <laughs> this is a requirement. I don't need it for everyday use. I don't need it particularly to uh, boost my self-confidence or my ego because I was already active, strong, fit guy before I started. Like, it wasn't starting for that reason. I was starting because, hey, 
this is something I can be good at and I enjoy it. Um, so let's do it. You know, like a guy that picks up a football and he's fucking hell, I'm good at this. Maybe I can make a career out of it. So it mm-hmm. was like that. So when I stopped competing, I'd stopped taking steroids, like cold turkey. Cold turkey yeah. And this, I can tell you, please, guys, don't do this. Yeah? Because what's going to happen if you've been on a large amount of hormones for, for years, which most guys that compete, they've been on for many years, maybe a decade or maybe more, your own natural production of testosterone is shut down. Now, can it come back? Maybe in some people, maybe yes, maybe no. Um, and I, I was in England in the mid nineties and I went to see an endocrinologist and he didn't really have a good advice for me. Um, so I, I just stopped. And then you've got no testosterone floating around the system. And these are powerful hormones that affect your mind. Yeah. So the fact that I've been forced into retirement with an injury is already possible depressive situation. It was almost like, what do I do with my day now? My whole day, my whole life revolves around training for this contest, competing in this contest. Now I don't have one. So I can go to the gym and train as I like to, but what about the rest of the day? And what's the, what's the point now of this? <laughs> what's the point of my life? It is such a tunnel vision. Um, so I was in a depressive situation and uh, deficient hormones as well. So I went into you know deep clinical depression, suicidal thoughts, insomnia. I mean, it was it was terrible. Well, I didn't know what was going on or what to do about it, nor did anyone else around me. They used to me to being this, you know, the leader, the positive guy, the strong guy who solves everyone's problems, helps everybody. Now this guy is like, nobody knew what to do to help me. Um, in the end, I just figured out myself, like, I'm going to have to go back on a small... Uh, dose of testosterone. Now I'm sure there's a lot of doctors around uh, on the internet that specialize in anabolics and therapy and um, male testosterone replacement. All, all the information is out there now. Um, it's not difficult to find, but then it wasn't. So that would be like the worst thing you could do is just stop cold turkey. Um, you, you, could try, you could try to taper off and you can use something like HCG to stimulate your own testosterone production and may come back if you're young enough. Um, but good chances are if you've been on a period of time, it won't. So if that's the case, then you need to take a replacement. Just like a woman who's gone through menopause, they can take hormone replacement. And that's very socially acceptable. Whereas men, because it's testosterone and the whole you know, uh, stigma attached to that and, uh, and the bodybuilding and steroids and everything, is not... Now it's starting to be more accepted and, and promoted, and the information is out there that even if you hadn't taken steroids, you, there's many men who get into middle age, you get into the late 30s, 40s, or 50s, and their own testosterone is very low, and they start to get depression, they start to get uh, putting on body fat, losing muscle, they start to get maybe diabetes, arthritis. All these age-related diseases can be put into reverse by putting your hormones back in a good place. So... Um, if you're taking steroids, anyway, you should be getting regular blood checks to see what's going on. And if you're going to come off, then you need to find somebody that can help you do that. Um, you know, everyone, everyone's an individual case that needs to be treated. Um, but that's just me sharing my experiences. And, you know, I, I take testosterone placement to this day, and I, I always will. And I believe it's uh, something that's very positive for my health. Mm. What, what do you take? What is the product? Uh, testosterone and anti. Um, I take 250 milligrams, split it up into little doses, but over about 10 to 12 days, that keeps me in a good range of uh, free testosterone, which is really the blood test that you need to see how much testosterone is available. So that's a free testosterone. Um, well, you need, you need a full blood panel, testosterone, free testosterone, estradiol and thyroid and everything like that. You know, it's something you should have regularly anyway. I think, first of all, it was very difficult to find medical help with this. Now it's a lot easier. Um, but even being easier, sometimes I think guys are like, they feel like they'd rather not know. 
Mm -hmm. Is anything bad going on? Because then they have the dilemma of what am I going to do now? So they want to stick their heads in the sand and just carry on. Um, that's not the best thing to do. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> I know that well, during the days of Mr. Olympia, you were training for about 40 to 50 minutes, four days a week. But I wonder, yeah. I know that your workouts were crazy to get these monstrous results, but I think that more important is what you did outside of this 50 minutes during the day. because well, You have a, a process, and if you can understand the process, then you can understand why I trained like that and why I was so successful. First of all, you have to have, a, um, for muscle growth, you have to have some stimulus. You have to have some stress. That's above the level of stress that your body's accustomed to, or your muscles in this case are accustomed to. So you need to do more, and you need to push them into this zone where they're failing, where they cannot function anymore. And they're, you know, they're breaking down. So this is the stimulus. Then after this, there needs to be recovery. You need to recover and then later overcompensate from this stress. So in order for this to happen beyond the first two years, of, one or two years of training, when you can train kind of a little bit haphazard and everything like that, and you will still get results because your body's not used to anything at that point. So even if you don't do a push-up and you do 20 push-ups a day, it's something, right? Well, pretty soon your body gets used to that. And it's the same thing with lifting weights. And then you've got to really push it. You've got to, like, you control the weight. You've got to focus the, the contraction and the muscles you want and so on and so on to make it more intense. Well, then you have to recover from this. And only after you recover can the overcompensation, or i.e. in this case growth, take place. So first of all, you need sufficient intensity of exercise to click that switch. Intensity, not length. It's not about how long or how many sets you can do. Uh, if it was, then logically, as a beginner, maybe you train for an hour a day, and then later on it'd have to be two hours, and you know, get to Mr. Olympia, you'd be training 12 hours a day, right? Um, but we know that doesn't happen. So that can't be the factor that needs to constantly increase. The overload, the intensity is something that needs to, to increase. So it's about short, targeted workouts and then being able to recover from that workout. The longer the workout is, the chances are you're not really working that hard, right? So if I said to you, okay, let's go outside, man. Okay, fucking sprint. Sprint. How long are you going to sprint before the sprint becomes a semi-jog and then it becomes a jog, right? So my point is you can only work in that intensity level for short periods of time so if people say to me oh, i trained for two hours today <laughs> no you didn't you're in the gym for two hours you are not training um people that train with me we train for like average 40 minutes maybe and you know they are fucked at the end they, they don't want to do anymore uh, they got the message and then they go home they rest they get all the nutrients that they need they get the sleep that they need Just like a baby, really, you know, as a baby doesn't train because it's naturally growing anyway, but it eats a lot, sleeps a lot, shits a lot, you know, <laughs> like a body So that's, that's the process. You go and you focus the exercise, you push for a limited amount of sets, and some of those sets you go to an absolute point of failure. So you're putting 100% into these sets. Also, mentally, it's easier to do that if it's a short workout. Mm. If I say to you, right, man, We warm up first, of course, but then we've got one set of leg press or squats or whatever you want to do. Man, you're going to fucking go on this. You're going to go to the bottom and you're going to come up and you're going to fucking keep doing this until you die, man. And when you think you're dying, I'm going to fucking make you do two more until you literally can't walk. If you know you've only got one set, maybe I can get you to do that. But if I say to you, hey, man, you've got 10 more sets after this, there's no way you're going to do it because mentally, even if it's subconsciously, You will hold yourself back. You will preserve yourself because you have more to do. Yeah. Mm. So my workouts are not about doing more. It's about warming up on an exercise, doing one or two sets to warm up, and then, right, let's go, 100%. Uh, and it's all controlled. Slow down the negative portion of the rep so the negative, uh, you get negative overload. Um, control, no bouncing, no swinging, absolute focus, 
to the point of failure and then beyond failure with assisted reps or extra negatives or, or whatever it takes. Um, so those workouts are short but very effective. Now we've turned on that switch. We've stressed the body beyond what it's normally used to. Now it will respond as long as it is in the situation of being able to recover. And at some point, this is where steroids come into the picture. Because at some point, it gets very difficult to recover from these workouts, and then you get to a plateau. That's where steroids become very useful, because you can boost your hormone level up, and now you can recover from more stress. So you don't sit on your ass and take steroids and watch TV and get 20-inch biceps. You know, you've got to lift the weights, right? And they allow you to recover, allow your body to utilize the protein, and, and so on. So. Um, that's why they're used in bodybuilding so much. And, and basically any sport that requires increased muscle mass or increased strength and explosiveness. Mm. There will be all of sports. I don't care what they say, what chest they have. We're competitive yeah. animals will do whatever they have to do. Mm. Yeah. Uh, we spoke about it before we hit record. Uh, and I believe it's the more important topic what do you think is the biggest problem that people are facing today? Uh, well, right now we have um, an awakening going on. I think, and, you know, more and more people like yourself are doing podcasts talking about spirituality and, and uh, becoming more and more aware of this connection that we have to the spirit, to the nature, and the fact that we are away from that is making people sick. You know, we're living in cities, we're relying on technology, we're not getting out and exercising the way we should, we're not getting out in the nature, we're not getting out by the trees and the grass that we, in the past we would have been exposed to a lot. So um, I think there's a lot to do with that, like disconnect from things that are, that are important and that are real. Um, so now you've got like, uh, I look at it like this, like there is an awakening going on, there is an internal revolution going on, and uh, it's like cells waking up in a chrysalis that wants to turn into a butterfly. There has to be one cell that wakes up first, right? And then another one, another one, another one. So I think that's what we have now um, happening. And, uh, Maybe the people that are feeling very uncomfortable are, you know, it's just a, it's just a catalyst, just a stimulus for them to question everything, and question how they're living and question what they're doing. This uncomfortable feeling, that's what it is. That's why you're feeling down. That's why you're feeling depressed. That's why you're feeling anxious at night. All these things. Um, is that okay? I like. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think your wife is is there. No, no, it's my wife or my daughter. I think it's my daughter in there. Um, so that's what it is. We're feeling this need to question everything, this need to change, uh, and it's happening, and it's happening one person at a time, and it's like a domino effect. Uh, if you, this is what I come to realize, it's like the young Dorian wanted to go on the street and riot and smash things and fight the system and fight the police, which is, is just futile because then you, you know, you, you're just doing more negativity, putting gas, gasoline on the fire. So now it's, it's, it's internal, and as we are changing ourselves, we're changing like the reflection, the world around us, and that the people that we meet, they're, they're changing somehow. Even if you don't teach them anything or talk to them, and just your presence will make people question, well, you know, what's up with this guy? You know, somehow he seems to be more at peace and calmer, and oh, I'm interested in that. What is that? Mm. And, and that's how it happens. And that's the revolution that's going on, and it's a... Uh, it's an internal revolution. That's that's what I believe, and I think the world is going to change to a much better place. Will it be traumatic along the way? I'm sure. Yes, it will be. Um, just like childbirth. Yeah, you had some kids. You had some twins recently, right? So I mean, must is a beautiful thing to to have a child come into this world. It's amazing. It's like a miracle. You see your child born. But it's also messy. There's blood and there's shit and there's pain involved. So I think we will be seeing a bit of that. But the ultimate outcome will be something beautiful. And I don't know if it happened in my lifetime. 
uh, doesn't really matter to me. I mean, you know, I'll probably come back in another guise. If I need to. <laughs> uh, who knows? But I feel it's happening, man. It's happening. There's so much more, so many more people now that, uh, that are aware of, uh, consciously aware and then they're aware that we're a spiritual being that is here for this experience in the physical world, in a physical body. Like, you know, some people even feel uncomfortable with that, like that they feel depressed and anxious because they kind of feel that they don't belong here almost sometimes. Um, so there's a lot going on when you feel this, when you feel uncomfortable, I just use that word. Just look into it, think into it, meditate. What, what's going on? What do you need to do? And then have some faith in the, the universe and the messages coming through. You, if you're listening. You, you said it so well. Like people feel like shit. They're depressed. They don't feel happy with their lives. They feel something's wrong. They feel that they're not in the right place. And yeah. that is nothing more but a call to action. Like, what are you doing wrong and why do you feel like this? But p people just complain. Oh, I feel like shit. I know you feel like shit. Like, do something. Like, yeah. when I was back in Bulgaria, running my business, making more money than I ever hoped that I would make in my life, had everything that people believe you should have to be super happy, I got seriously depressed and for two months i was not coming out not picking up my phone everyone was getting like freaked out my family well, my you, friends you should have been according to society according to what's projected to us through the media, happiest person you on the planet great, man. what the fuck are you worrying about you got this money you got financial security man you like you've won the lotto man what the fuck's wrong with you i mean well you've been there you know that's not that didn't make you feel satisfied. So you work your ass off towards this goal and now you're pissed off because you got that goal and it's not what you what you think it will bring you. I know a lot of people that are like super wealthy and they're not they're the miserable motherfuckers that you can meet. You know, they're not happy. That gonna bring them happiness. Nothing wrong with it. Here's the thing. Nothing wrong with material things. They are what they are. And if you you know if you like them and you can get them, great. But is not going to bring you what you may think it's going to bring you. And they project these celebrities and so on at, at us that they, this is the peak of, you know, uh, wow, if I could only be like these people. Well, you know, these people have more fucking problems than the average person. Like, you know, it just amplifies everything. You need to, it's inside. It's inside. It's not outside. You know, a, a car, a house. and bank account is outside it's not inside mm. um some of the happiest people you meet like they're just simple and they don't have much yeah yeah i i believe you should have like all the necessary things covered so you feel the safety you live in a yeah. safe neighborhood you can provide when someone gets sick or kicked out of work and stuff like that after that there is not really that much of a difference whether you will make a hundred thousand or one or 10 millions it doesn't I don't know where I read, read it but I read it somewhere they did you know surveys and studies who knows how good they are and how many people they had and everything but anyway I read it and I, I think well that makes sense um, they were like money does make you happier but only to a certain degree once you got enough to cover all these basics like you know you're living with the roof over your head you're paying your bills and everything like that I don't know what it was. I think it was, just, well, I think it was like seventy thousand uh, dollars. Seventy-five, something like this. Yeah, yeah. yeah In yeah, the states, for, for a household or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then over over this, you know, you don't you don't get much. Yeah. You don't feel any better, and sometimes they feel worse because now they have to manage this money, mm -hmm. and everyone's trying to take it off them, and <laughs> they're scared and to lose it now. Yeah, and and here's the thing: like when they say seventy five thousand, they take into consideration that people will live in the way that someone has shoved into our throat that you should be living this way. When you shouldn't. I mean, why why do you need the huge house which you're not using eighty percent of it, <clears throat> or why do you need two cars which are that brand and that brand? And why do you need it? You need it to show it to everybody else. To put it on Instagram. That's right. <laughs> to show it to everybody else how successful you are. And how good you should feel, but maybe you don't. So it's just society that's telling us this. What is success? Wow, this guy is successful. Look how he's you know he's done this, and uh, 
you know, uh, and he's the president and he's got this business with billions or he's a movie star and this, wow, we should all admire this guy because he's a success. But is he re or she really a success? How do we know how they feel inside? Mm -hmm. That should be the success. And, and what positive impact you're having on people and the environment and the world around you during your time here in this experience that we call life as a human being like that's i mean that's really what you're going to take with you right you're mm. not going to take the car you're not going to take the house you're not going to take the bank account you're taking with you your experience yeah. your experiences your lessons and your impact um <clears throat> on the collective around you on the environment on the people on on everything around you and uh, you know maybe at the end when you pass over you, you're gonna ask yourself the question what did I do uh, what good did I do I think that's the only relevant mm. question that you're probably gonna have to answer to yourself yeah so so if there is a 25 or 30 year old girl or guy listening right now and they feel like shit because that's like 90% of the world in my yeah. experience and they're like, what do I do? Like, how do I accelerate this awakening? Uh, and you run this ayahuasca retreat in Costa Rica. I've yeah. been there to the same place. I know how much it has accelerated my development into this world of like just waking up from all the bullshit. And I'm sure that it has done the same for you. But what, what should they do? Like, what, what are well, the tools? Psychedelics are a powerful tool, if you like. Um, ayahuasca is one of them. And now... I mean, in UK, they are now really having some properly funded studies on the effects of uh, psilocybin, magic mushrooms, people call them, psilocybin, um, LSD, uh, on brain chemistry and depression and all that. So now they're really looking into it. And also I would like to see more research into um, a cannabis plant. Um, I'm a big believer in this is huge health benefits there uh, and what and why and how you know what's the best way to use these tools right um, so maybe people can't go to an ayahuasca camp great if you can and, and you can look into psychedelics we don't have time to cover everything here but I think they're a powerful tool if they're used correctly in the right setting and everything like that you've got to be careful with that you don't want to be messing mm -hmm. around with these things uh, trying to have fun and take it in a party or something like that. This is not a party thing. This is not the way to do it. And that can be quite a negative experience if you're not careful because you're surrounded by all these different energies and so on. might not be good. Um, so you can look into that. I think exercise, if you're not doing it, that's essential. Whatever exercise, Whatever works for you. I mean, I, I'm not, I now do variety. I do yoga, I do Pilates, I do biking, I do just hiking in nature, uh, and a little bit of weights in the gym. So whatever um, you can find, there's, this is going to help your brain chemistry, especially if you can uh, be lucky enough to do outdoors. Um, it's, oh, it's a little bit like uh, sports, uh, spirituality, spiritual practices, because you need discipline, mm. right? So meditation is your foundation tool. Anyone that's interested in expanding their consciousness or like going down a spiritual path daily or, you know, you don't have to be dogmatic, like I gotta do this every day, but I mean, I do it for most every day. Sometimes, you know, I don't feel like it or I miss it or whatever. It's not, you know, I don't get down on myself about that, but. Mostly, it's a daily practice. I do some meditation. I do some deep breathing. I'm taking time out. I'm checking out of this story, this movie that we're in, this illusion. And it is. It's an illusion, right? Even quantum mm. physicists are confirming this now. Uh, we're living in a holographic, computer-generated reality. That's you know, funny as it might seem, the, the Matrix was pretty spot on. Uh, that movie. There's a lot of true messages in there. And that's not my idea. This is, you know, guys way smarter than me saying this. Um, so you're taking time to check out and to go inside and to be still, concentrate on your breathing. And I'll, I'll go here because a lot of people say to me, like, well, how do you meditate? I don't know how to meditate. I, 
I don't think I'll be good at meditating because I can't just sit there and think of nothing. It's not sitting there and thinking of nothing, right? But I think a good place to start would be to find an, a good uh, guided meditation. Yeah. Is that yeah. way you're listening to the instructions on the headphone and you're doing and you're concentrating and this helps to get you inside and, and, and take you away. And later on, you know, I could sit down get my hair cut now and, and just close my eyes and go somewhere and be out of the room almost. But it takes time to do that, like anything, like going to the gym, learning to do a bench press. Like you can't do it perfectly the first day. You know, there's, there's practice involved in skill and you get stronger and you get better and you get better neural pathways and your muscles get bigger and all that stuff. So um, you got to work on it and just taking time out, maybe 15 or 20 minutes. Preferably in the morning, before you turn mm. on that fucking phone, before mm -hmm. you turn on that computer, right? Take your time, drink some water, do some little bit of stretching, sit down and do your meditation, and let this be a ritual that you start your day with. Because now you're starting on a good foot. Now you're starting on a better vibration. So when you open your phone in the morning, and it's the first thing you do, and you've got an email, and you've got the fucking bill, and all this, and there's a problem, like your stress hormones is going, and that's the start of your day and you're setting like this is your vibrational frequency that you're going to be putting out all day and the universe gives you back what you what you're projecting right so if you're projecting negativity and fear and and lack and all that this is what's going to come back to you so you've got to change your signal i'm not saying all this is fucking easy right i'm just saying you know not like bodybuilding is easy you've got to work on it so it's the same thing but if you took that time to do that, take that time in the morning for yourself, for you, take care of you, right? And do your meditation yourself. Now you after your meditation, you're on a good, positive vibration. And now you open your phone and you've got the bill and you've got the problem. But it won't affect you in the same way as it did if you just you hadn't done your meditation. So it's just putting yourself, going inside putting yourself into a positive kind of feeling, positive mindset, and slipping away from this world for a little bit, giving your, your mind a break. Um, this is a good starting place. This, an exercise, and then, you know, obviously a good diet, um, the supplementation, all these things will give you a good base. Like these are daily things that you should be mm. doing. Then, mm. you, can, you know, something like... Um, a yoga retreat or, or a Vipassana or an ayahuasca camp or some psychedelic experience is something that would be done from time to time as like a big kind of upgrade, a big update, something like this. And then, but it's not going to take place of daily practice. Mm. You're not going to go to an ayahuasca camp and have all this... Uh, revelations and information and uh, improvement of your vibration. And then you go home and do nothing and start drinking beer and eating chips and that's not going to work. You need to be working all the time, just like on your fitness or your physique. You, you can't expect to do a few great workouts and then Eat sit junk back. for two months oh. and be in great shape. Yeah, It's the same so thing. It, it kind of becomes your life, part of your lifestyle. And now, for me, it's the most important thing that I do. My spiritual advancement, my understanding, my trying to elevate my consciousness uh, is and to affect who and what I can around me in a positive way. That's, that's what I'm living for now. Mm -hmm. Everything else oh. is secondary to that. Yeah, I feel the same way, uh, and it's been like this for a couple of years now. What What was the biggest lesson that you got from ayahuasca? Wow, this every time is different. I've done like different camps. Some is one night, some is two or three or four. I've been totally now, I think twenty ceremonies. So everyone is different. Um, so it's difficult question to answer but for sure on a general level 
it puts you in touch with something much bigger than what you can perceive. What we can perceive is only what we get with our five senses, right? Touch, smell, sight, hearing, whatever, taste. Um, but there's much more. There's much more out there. We just can't see it. We can't perceive it, you know? Uh, if you've got a cat or a dog, you sometimes see them looking. Okay, they, they work on a different frequency. They can just pick up stuff that we can't pick up. Um, <clears throat> so with a psychedelic, you will be left in no doubt that there is much more out there and that you can connect to it and um, connect to another aspect of yourself, if you like. Maybe you can call it your higher self that knows everything already and can help you and can tell you. And It's like God, but it's like you as well. You know, that it's not separate. For me, this is what religion does. Religion tells you that you're something separate from the spirit, from the God or whatever you want to call it. And somehow you have to make your way back there and, you know, follow all these rules and dogma, which is usually just from society or from politics or whatever. Um, but it's already inside you. It's all there. Everything is inside you. It's just unlocking it and finding it. It's all there. There's nothing outside you. All this stuff we see, all these solid things and everything, at some level, it doesn't exist. Everything's inside. Mm. Yeah, I, I feel that after ayahuasca, uh, my meditations are much deeper now. Yeah. I, I did some gong meditation, like sound bath thing. And I started having super like deep experiences without any substances whatsoever. Yeah. And um uh, like now I go with a specific intention into my meditations and gong and stuff like that, whatever I do. And I get answers that are not there in my conscious everyday living. And these answers yeah. are so meaningful and they, they simply resolve the issue that I have on hand. And yeah, because that, you, you, you broke that veil with the ayahuasca, you broke that veil and you broke through into another level of, of uh, understanding or consciousness, or whatever you want to call it. Um, so once you've been there, it's kind of available to you easier mm -hmm. uh, yeah. in the future. And definitely yeah, your meditations will get deeper. Your intuition will be sharper. E even like, I, I use this analogy, like I say, when, when you go to, a, and you do ayahuasca, it's like, as if your brain was a computer and before you went there, your computer is full of old files and junk uh, stuff and slowing down the processing speed. And now you've done the ayahuasca, it's cleaned out all this junk, all these old files out of your brain and now it's just doo -doo -doo, the signals are firing and the computing uh, speed is, is much faster. So you just feel like upgraded uh, and you're, you're vibrational signal that you're giving off will be higher. And uh, every time I do ayahuasca, I'm like inundated with new opportunities afterwards. People contact me, business contacting me. It just, it just happens because I've changed my frequency somehow. <laughs> That's, that is a funny thing. because it, it was literally happening to me in the past couple of weeks. Uh, yeah. when I, I did ayahuasca, I had some crazy, like, like so many things which were bothering me were resolved, like the biggest problems in my life that have been there since I was a kid. Yeah. And then and then I was, because I, I decided that I will not have an intention related to work in business during the ayahuasca ceremony, uh, but I somehow got a glimpse of it. And then I started meditating, then I did this uh, gong meditation, and I was asking about business and what should my purpose be from now on? How can I help more people and really create the biggest impact for the world. Yeah. Uh, and I started having these visions of a community, of a city. And it's like, I'm asking this question, like how can I help people in the best possible way? And I'm getting this question back from this thing, whatever it is, like higher self or whatever higher people self. like to call it. Higher it. Self, you know? Yeah, like that, you. that's what I do as well. Yeah. And it's like, well, what has helped you the most? And I'm like, that's a good question. And I'm like, 
life experiences like the ayahuasca retreat or seminars or stuff like that and and i'm answering this question and it's like so what do you want to build like and i'm like all right maybe it's kind of a like a community where people can experience something and it's like how can you help them the most it's asking me the questions that i never asked myself and when i when it asks me the question i kind of come up with the answer straight away and it's like one hour of meditation and i come up with a business plan which I don't care about the business as much. I want to live this life and create this city and community for myself so I can then give it to other people as well and they can experience it. And I realize that if I want to help people the most to really create a, the biggest change possible, they really need to immerse themselves into a new lifestyle for at least a week or maybe two. Or if they like to, they can live there forever. So right now I created this project that I will start um, early next year in January to build a city in California, start small, obviously, where people can really focus on personal growth, human advancement and quality of life because the cities yeah. that we live in. Maybe I'll come and visit you, man. I'm going to be out there next year sometime. That will be amazing, man. It will be great to have you here. So I wanted to ask you, how do you envision such a city? What do people do there? How does their everyday life look like you wake up and you have the possibility to create your perfect day hour by hour what do they do well there's de definitely got to be some uh some gardening going on there right mm. i mean food growing mm. your own food i think is that's basic right taking yourself out of that loop where people are controlling the food and polluting the food and <clears throat> you can control what the soil's like, what goes into the plants, what what plants you use. Um, getting connected back to that, I think, is very important. So I'll definitely uh, be doing that. And maybe a lot of, uh, some amount of trading and bartering. Like, you know, hey, I need my car fixing. Well, I can fix cars. Maybe you can fix cars, but hey, you want to get fit? I can help you get fit. So you fix my car, I'll help you get fit. And tax man can't do shit with that, right? Because there's no money. <laughs> um, so that would be great. Like um, part of the community. And uh, getting, uh, getting away from this financial system as much as possible, I think would be important. And uh, I'm quite interested in cryptocurrency, whether that could be a way of doing it. Or, you know, there are communities out there that do this kind of bartering or trading or something like that. Not quite sure how it works, but um, I definitely think there's more and more people interested in living a different way and getting out of the system. But how do they do it exactly? I don't have all the answers yet, but people like yourself and myself and we keep thinking about it and working on it, it'll, it'll come together. So I, I think that's, that's an amazing idea. I had a kind of similar idea, but it was more like a, a retreat for people to come and go. They could come. And um, my, uh, there's nothing that's in action yet, but I was thinking if, you know, I love animals as well. If somehow people are working with the animals, it helps the animals, but it helps the people as well because, you know, it's been proven people with health problems, psychological problems, if they're around an animal, just petting a, a, an animal is, is, is very helpful. It changes the heart rate and the frequency and, and everything like that. So. Uh, I think working with plants and animals, I mean, that's what we used to do anyway, like primitive man. I mean, we'd be surrounded by that all the time. Mm. Um, so that would be part of it and some kind of alternative trading or currency and so on to get us out of this debt-based uh, system that we're all in. I, I heard you spoke about the pineal gland and how uh, the governments put stuff in the water that calcify it. And it's also in the toothpaste and stuff like that. Yeah, have you actually is, done fluoride yeah. is in a lot of water? So I mean Have you done some work actually on that to reverse the damage and have you seen some results? Uh well I take various supplements that could help with that. And of course meditation and psychedelics are gonna help crack that open as well. Is it something that we can analyze and look inside the brain? Not really. So it's hard to quantify that whether that's happening or not. But um I feel I'm a lot more intuitive than I used to be. I mean, it used to be terrible to like pick up people's vibe or uh, and things like that. I'm, I'm much more than I used to be, but I couldn't put my finger on 
hey, it's this thing that did it. I've done, I'm doing so many different things. I'm doing breath work. I'm doing meditation. Uh, I use cannabis. I use psychedelics from time to time. Um, I just did my last camp out in Saltara uh, <clears throat> about a month ago, actually, well, six, five or six weeks ago. Um, so we'll, we'll do one next year for sure. I did two this year. But it depends on my schedule, but for sure, I'll do one camp because there's a lot of people want to come and, and do it when I'm there. A lot of people from the fitness community, gym world, that are now interested to do it, maybe because I've done it first. So um, interest is exploding all around anyway. And in fact, the last camp I had, there was a few people there that were not even from the gym world. They just heard me talking on podcasts and it got them interested and they came along. And uh, I can't tell you how many times I've heard this after an Ayahuasca experience. This is the fucking best day of my life. Yeah. I mean, I, I heard that a lot of times. So, um, and, uh, you know, people have been working on things, they've been going to therapy for years and all that stuff. And uh, they're like, one night of this just blows away. 10 years of therapy is, it's so deep and so helpful on so many levels. Um, I just never feel I'm doing justice trying to describe it because it's so difficult. Yeah, as you know, impossible. You yeah. It, right? what, what kind of supplements you take for the pineal gland? Uh, not specifically for the pineal gland, but I take um, I take Bocapa, which is a plant which is helping all the brain chemistry. Um, and Vimpocetine I take as well. It's another uh, brain enhancer. They're all natural supplements. Mm -hmm. um, of course, I take CBD and uh, cannabis. I either take the extract, the oil, or I smoke a little bit. So I think uh, all those things have a positive effect, as well as breathing and meditation and so on. Mm -hmm. Clean water. Mm -hmm. I actually have a machine called the Kanga machine which cleans the water and alkalines it and uh, ionizes it as, as well. So I've been using that for a few years. I think that's a good investment. Mm. You hook it up to your water supply. and Because even bottled water is not ideal. I mean, you know, it's in plastic. Um, it's usually on the, they're on the side of being acidic as well. So that's not great. Um, but, I mean, tap water is even worse. Tap water is terrible. It's, it's got fluoride in there. Uh, toothpaste has got fluoride in, so just, you know, you can get a fluoride-free toothpaste easy enough from the health food store, so that's easy to avoid, but a lot of people don't know about it. I mean, you know, if you look on there, it's got a poisons warning on there even. If a young child swallows a toothpaste, take them to the hospital, it tells you. I mean, <laughs> got to tell you something there, right? Just brushing your yeah. teeth with this poison, uh, it can't be a good idea. Yeah. And then you have all the uh, dentists shoving them in, in, in your hands because they say it helps your teeth, but what else does it do to your brain and to the rest of, of the know, body? Man, you know, like a lot of these t dentists and doctors and so on, uh, you can't get mad at them because they just don't have the information. They, they're trained. Yeah, yeah. They're trained at medical school and universities, which are normally funded by the same people that control the pharmaceutical companies. So, you know, they're only taught one way of doing things. And even like doing outside of these parameters, they could be risking their career and their, their, their salary and everything like that. You know, if you're an oncologist mm -hmm. and you find out that cannabis helps cure cancer, can't exactly tell your patients, hey, don't take this chemotherapy, do this, do this cancer, do this cannabis oil and do this, change your diet alkaline your diet, all these things that people have used and cured their own, you know, they, they can't do that, right? They would lose their job. And there's mm -hmm. literally billions a year being generated by this cancer industry with the chemotherapy and radiation. And, and then you've got all the fucking charities that play on our emotions, you know, come on, donate and help stop this terrible disease. But they haven't stopped it. They haven't, you know, it's just getting more and more prevalent. Now it's like one in two people are likely to get cancer in a lifetime where, I don't know, 30 years ago it was like one in 20 or something. So it's got worse, despite all this money. 
that's yeah. been stifled out of us. Uh, it's got worse, and the treatment is a poison or a fucking cut it out or burn it out. It's, it's barbaric. That I mean, the, the, there's better treatments out there, but they're suppressed because perhaps they don't, don't make money for the right people. Yeah, you know, cannabis is a plant that grows from the ground pretty easy, and you know, you can't patent it. That's the thing. So there's not much money in it for for this industry. But I believe people are going to wake up. And if they stop, if they wake up and decide to use alternative treatments and stop using pharmaceuticals, then the pharmaceutical industry got two choices, go out of business or change their, their Ways, approach. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing with McDonald's. If everyone stops eating that shit, they got two choices, go out of business or change their menu to something healthy because people are asking for it. So we, we've mm. got power, man. We've all got power in, in our choices and what we buy and so on. There's, there's power there. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Man, I know you already do so many amazing things and you're here talking to me, sharing your lessons and taking time out of your life with your amazing family. I'm sure they have something very tasty in the room behind you. And I'm I'm gonna leave you in just a bit, but like if if I am to challenge you to double your impact, to do even more for for the people out there like if if you are to invent it, if someone put a gun to your head and said like, man, you must do more, you must do more, you must help yeah. more people, like what what would you do differently? Well, I don't know, man. I, I've been playing around with this idea of doing my own podcast and like getting guests on there that I find fascinating. Um, so I'm still like bouncing this ball around. Should I do it? Should I not do it? So I don't know. If you if you're listening, let me know what you think. Let me think about that because it wouldn't be. Well, maybe I have some bodybuilders on there that I find interesting, but it wouldn't be, you know, just about bodybuilding. There's a lot of people out there, a lot of people that I find fascinating that I would personally like to meet and learn from. But perhaps I would share that with everybody else. So mm. that's the thought that's going around in my head at the moment. Probably I'm just procrastinating and need to get on with it. What? Anyway, we'll, we'll push you. We'll, we'll push you into that for sure. So yeah. yeah, everyone who is listening and watching, like drop a comment down below to say like whether you want Dorian to have a podcast. Yeah, let me know. I no. can do a podcast and maybe some YouTube clips on. Okay, so how many you comments? Guys, that's... If you guys want to hear from me, that would be, you know, if you give me some feedback, then, uh, you know, that's what I did. My One of my first big podcasts was London Real. That was like six, seven years ago. And I just went on there with no intentions, just that the guys were wanting to talk about anything which was new to me. Because normally if I was a guest, people just want to talk about bodybuilding. So that's what we talk about. And these guys are like, hey, we want to talk about anything. I'm like, I'm up for that, man. Um, <laughs> so I enjoy doing these broadcasts now, but maybe um, me interacting with various guests who are experts in, in different subjects would be interesting for the audience out there so let me know guys if you think that's uh, something you would be interested in i believe a lot of people around the world will be very interested so if if, if you need proof we'll get it for you <laughs> for sure right. <laughs> man uh, i know you you have your uh, brand dorian yates nutrition and i know it's super popular in europe and it's coming soon to the us i'll drop a link to it in the description below when, when is it coming to the us do you know already uh, we don't know yet. I'm hoping before the end of uh, 2020. We've, we've kind of relaunched the brand in the last couple of years in Europe and the Middle East, and it's on fire. So, and like we've got so much demand from the US. People are always messaging me, taking time to, you know, out of their day to ask for it. So I'm sure the demand is great there. It's just, you know, any business that's growing is steps that you have to take. You can't run too fast, otherwise, you can fall over. So, uh, is definitely our intention to be there next year. And as soon as I know something more specific, then I'll let people know. But we're working nice. on it. Nice, nice. I have a, one last question for you. If you could leave nothing to your children but just one sentence of advice, what would that be and why? Question everything, even me. That's it. That's, that's something I've taught the, my, both of my kids to not accept everything to question everything and, uh, you know, the school system, the way society is structured and everything is not, is not for our benefit. So take what you can from it, but be aware of that and just 
question everything, question what the teacher at school, go research yourself. Even if I tell you something, I could be wrong, you know, go, go check it out. Think for yourself. That's the main thing. Think for yourself. 